Graphic Audio, a movie in your mind. Imagine humanity's worst nightmare. A world that didn't see the end of the Cold War in the early 1990s, but in September of the year 2001, in the form of nuclear Armageddon. The end of the world. Civilization obliterated in a matter of minutes. The great city's gone in a blinding flash, and the deadly glow illuminates the nighttime sky for years to come. Lakes boil, mountains fall, and the topography of North America is changed forever. Burning clouds of poison fill the sky in an endless, raging hurricane. And acid rain pounds the lush farmland and forests of the continent into sterile desert. Fragments of humanity survive, but the tissue-thin tapestry of societal order has been ripped apart. The rule of law is replaced overnight with the brutal reality of survival of the fittest. Amid the crumbling ruins, the strong prey on the weak. The darkness in the heart of man knows no restraint. And ragged souls fight to the death over a dented can of food or a single precious bullet. Any type of gun is more valuable than gold, the only defense against the horrible swarms of muties. Twisted abominations that arise from the new craters and feast on the flesh of humanity. Slowly, over the long decades, a form of meager civilization returns to the land. Crude walled cities, known as villes, arise from the ashes of the past. Most often, the populations of these villes are ruthlessly governed by iron-fisted barons, backed by a private army of brutal sekmen. <laughs> Remnants of technology, weaponry, and a handful of functioning vehicles are guarded jealously. But electricity is seldom seen. Starvation is universal. Rape and atrocity a part of daily existence. This is America at the end of the 21st century. Welcome to the Deathlands. But there are good people here. A band of survivors, thrown together by the hand of fate, bring new meaning to the term nuclear family. Fierce survivalist warriors with uncanny skills and ingenuity they travel the Deathlands in search of a place to build a peaceful life for themselves. We're just travelers on the long road north, come to water and rest, and willing to pay for it. Ryan Cotter, a rugged, practical man of quiet nobility and fierce countenance, a tall figure of iron musculature with long black hair and a jagged scar down one side of his face, intersecting the patch that covers the ruin of his left eye. The unspoken leader of the group, I'm on point. JB covers the rear. Three foot spread. There's a bad feel to this place. Christy Roth, a statuesque Amazon warrior, a devotee of Gaia, the Earth Mother, with mutant psychic abilities, whose fiery red hair is actually an empathic sensory organ and reflects in its subtle movement Christy's perceptions. She is Ryan's lover and most intimate confidant. We may never get another chance, lover. Dark night! J.B. Dix, the armorer, a master of weaponry and ordnance, a cheerful cynic and an intuitive mechanical genius. John Barrymore Dix sports a precious pair of eyeglasses and a weather-beaten fedora and smokes a cigar when he can get his hands on one. Brian's oldest friend, from the time when they both worked a caravan of traders, the unspoken communication between the two has saved the companions' lives on more than one occasion. Got you covered. Company coming. Lots of them. But I want to test anything before we drink it. Clear doesn't always mean clean. Dr. Mildred Wyeth. Born in the previous century, known as Predark by Deathlanders, the feisty Dr. Wyeth was cryogenically frozen just years before Skydark in a desperate life-saving measure following a routine surgery gone awry. Ryan's people discovered and resuscitated her nearly a century later. An African-American physician whose avocations conveniently included marksmanship 
Mildred brings her scientific knowledge and 20th century perspective to bear as a vital component in the companion's continued survival. No sign of any power lines. Might have been a satellite base or a microwave transmission relay for telephones. By the three Kennedys, what have we here? Dr. Theophilus Tanner. Another time traveler, this time quite literally. Doc Tanner was a professor of philosophy in the 19th century, living an idyllic existence with his beloved wife and children until he was trawled through time as the unwilling subject of a late 20th century scientific experiment. The arrogant white coats grew tired of Doc's uncooperative attitude and furthered their experimentation by propelling him forward in time to the deathlands of Ryan Cotter's era, unwittingly saving Doc from the nuclear disaster that took their own lives. The trauma of being torn from his loved ones and plummeting through time has taken its toll on Doc, physically and mentally. Though much younger in years lived, he has the physical appearance of a man in his 60s and suffers periodic bouts of dementia. Despite these shortcomings, Doc is a valued member of the team, a surprisingly fierce fighter, and a font of wisdom and gentility from a more civilized time. No need for pejoratives. Besides, that particular epithet has not been appropriate in my case for centuries. Dad? I actually chilled that scaly back there. Dean caught her. Ryan's son, through a brief relationship with the boy's now deceased mother, Dean is the adolescent spitting image of his father at the same age. Although he's only known his father for a few years, the bond between the two is strong, as is the boy's natural emulation of his father, often bordering on rivalry. Dean is a good marksman, a quick learner, and strives to be treated as an equal to the adults in the group. Yeah, no shit. I can hardly believe it myself. Move, people! Jack Lauren. Born and raised as a hunter in the bayous of Louisiana, Jack is an albino teenager whose tracking skills and stealth are a valuable asset. Jack is a man of exceptionally few words and a dangerous warrior even without a gun in his hands for he carries concealed in his clothing an arsenal of leaf-bladed throwing knives. Blade man knows. More than friends, as close as any family, they are a superbly efficient fighting team, as lethal as their brutal environment dictates, struggling to hold on to their humanity in a land that knows no mercy. Early on in their travels, the companions made a startling discovery. A vast system of hidden underground redoubts built by the Predark military, which contain mysterious technology, including the amazing Matrans units. A network of teleportation portals that enable the companions to travel almost instantly, if randomly and often blindly, to another redoubt somewhere in the world. Employing their functional understanding of this miraculous technology in their search, the companions never know where the Matrans units will land them, but in the Deathlands, the odds are always against them. Demetriou threw the wagon to a spin, throwing Chambers and Thornton into each other. <laughs> well, well, they got balls. I'll give them that. Even the bitches. Demetriou slew the vehicle counter to the grain of the land, bucking as he hit a rise that he would otherwise have avoided. Gordon braced himself and looked over his shoulder at the cold hearts in the rear. They're ready to rumble, boys. Looks like they want some action. Just as Chambers and Thornton had been taken by surprise, so too had the companions in the wag ahead. It was only the fact that there were four of them squeezed tighter in the rear of the vehicle that saved them from greater injury. Ryan, what? I get it. Take the fight to them. Why not? Offense is the best form of defense. Ryan was heading straight for the wag that had been pursuing them. For the first time, he got a clear look at his opponents. Two in front, two in back. The wag jockey had an intense, focused look about him. The man next to him, older, more battle-scarred, looked more like a veteran. Ryan didn't get a clear look at the two in the back before the wag slid to one side, trying to flank them. With their knowledge of the territory, Ryan couldn't let them do that. Ignoring the jolting, bone-rattling impact of each rut in the plane, he altered his own course so that he could stay head-on. Ryan tried to guide the wag over the treacherous terrain, but now even his visual guide was gone. In the yellow ochre dust cloud, he could see little more than a yard or two ahead. He knew the Coldheart's wag was bearing down on them, but from where? Ryan didn't even get a chance to curse as they were broadsided by the other wag. 
Now the other wag was still. Ryan forced himself to move, even though every muscle seemed to have lost its strength and solidity. He felt as if he was moving through quicksand. At the back of his mind, he felt the urge to give in to the blackness that wanted to enfold him. He knew he couldn't do it, even though it seemed so inviting. Oh, oh Chase, what the fuck are you... you... Demetrio turned in his seat and glared at Thornton, his eyes dead and cold, looking through Demetrio's very being as they sized up how he could kill him, slowly and agonizingly. Chambers, eyebrow raised, watched Thornton shrink back. Gordon put a hand on Demetrio's shoulder, turning him back to the wheel. Now, now, Chase. He can keep if you want. We got more important hunting. They stared at the wag in front of them as the dust settled. Shit! I thought I put them on their side. I figured you had, too. Still gotta work with what we've got. I tell you something, that was one hell of a hit they took. Must have scrambled their brains a little. Sure hope so. Only one way to find out. Now wait, Sean! Thornton's hand froze. Gordon looked from Thornton to the windshield, taking in what was happening in front of them. As the dust began to lay flat back to the earth, he could see that the figures in the other wag were hardly stirring. Yeah, let's go then. But take it slow. We know they're good. Just a matter of how fucked up Jace got them. <laughs> Fuck them up some more. James Axler's Deathlands is available at www.graphicaudio.net.